Thank you all. It is an honor and a delight to be here to see so many familiar faces and folks that have become friends through the years of doing this work, as well as to get a chance to get to know many new ones. So a little about myself, as was introduced, I'm an emergency physician. I am a researcher, a violence prevention researcher at Brown University. Um, and I'm also the co-founder and chief research officer of Affirm Research. And I was asked to share in 10 minutes or less um, how we can use the public health approach to solve gun violence. I will say 10 minutes is nowhere near adequate, right? So I'm going to try to do a little bit of a taste and an overview and then provide some resources for folks that are interested in learning more. I'm also always willing to chat with folks. And again, I know many of you throughout the audience are doing this work already as well. So as we've already heard uh, from Dr. Rosenberg, who is a idol of mine as well, I also have that groupy thing, there are four main steps, right, to the public health approach. So the first is, is that we gather data. We say who's dying and why. Second, we identify what the risk and protective factors are. Third, we uh, develop and then evaluate the efficacy of interventions. And fourth, only fourth, do we implement across the country. And what we've been stuck in in gun violence is skipping those first three steps for the reasons that have been outlined so well by the other panelists. Now, when you take this four-step approach, it works. This graph shows, as has been already said verbally by others, the trajectory in car crashes from that all-time high right about when I was born um, up until now where we've decreased car crash deaths by over 70%, not by taking cars off the road, but by putting in those bendable steering wheels, by changing uh, from seat belts, lap belts, to three-point seat belts, right? By getting people to use car seats, by changing drunk driving. Similarly, HIV AIDS. HIV and Paul Farmer's work was actually the reason I went into medicine. And this sense of HIV as a human rights issue and the importance of the public health approach was what changed the trajectory of that epidemic. It was only when we came together as a community and insisted on that four-step approach that we managed to decrease deaths by greater than 90%. Now, compare it to firearms, right? We've already talked today about the trajectory. We had a brief blip in firearm deaths in the mid-90s related to the crack epidemic. But then since the early 2000s, the numbers have inexorably been increasing again. Our current rate of deaths is over 12 per 100,000. Why are we making zero progress on firearms and actually going backwards? It's very simple. It is because we have not systematically applied this public health approach. Why not? Why have we not done it? We've heard some clues already. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It's not because we don't know how to do it. This is just a sampling of the agendas for action that have been published since Sandy Hook. The IOM report, our consensus statement from the FACTS Consortium, which is the largest NIH-funded group of researchers on firearm research in the country, $5 million over five years, sounds amazing, but virtually nothing in the larger scheme of NIH funding. Recommendations from the American College of Surgeons, from my own college, the American College of Emergency Physicians, and of course, from the National Academy of Medicine, from a symposium that we held with Kaiser last fall. We know what to do. In fact, last winter, many of us in this room got together under the um, generosity of the American College of Surgeons to come up with a series of recommendations for what public health interventions are needed. We don't need to sit and create another agenda. We have the outlines. We have the steps already. What's missing then? Three things. So the first is funding. Second, our stakeholder engagement, and the third is action. And I'm going to take us briefly through all three of those. So funding. This is one of my favorite papers that I trot out in every talk I give. Basically, uh, along the bottom is mortality rate. Along the y-axis is funding in billions of dollars. The gray line shows that for almost every disease and injury in this country, the amount of funding for the public health approach for research basically falls within a line that's commensurate to the burden, the mortality burden. Gun violence falls off that curve. It has gotten less than 2% of what would be predicted based on the mortality burden over the last 20 years. I recently redid this analysis with some of my um, co-investigators from the FACTS Consortium saying, well, FACTS has been funded, maybe this has shifted. It hasn't. It's still less than 2%. We would have to spend billions of dollars to make up for this deficit in funding. It is no wonder that our rate of injury and death is going up when we are not investing in solutions to this problem the same way that we have done for those other epidemics that I showed and that others have talked about. 
So this is number one, and if this group takes anything away, it is to drive for funding from the federal government, but also from other sources. Individual states, New Jersey, California, Washington, have stepped up. Individual philanthropies, the Arnold Foundation, Affirm Research, uh, Kaiser, have stepped up. But there needs to be a more systemic collaboration and dedication to creating the private as well as public funding that is needed to tackle this epidemic. It's how we started with AIDS, right? The Ryan White Foundation was one of our first things, the Rock Hudson Foundation. It was through private funding that we started to turn the curve, and I know we can do the same thing here. Okay, so that's funding. Second, stakeholders. So others have already talked about how gun violence is an issue that affects all of us, right? Young minority men are disproportionately affected, but so are the military, so are rural white men who disproportionately kill themselves with guns. Healthcare providers are also affected, as others have talked about. I and others in the room have countless friends who have stopped clinical practice after particularly traumatic gunshot wounds or mass shootings that they've taken care of. So what does engaging stakeholders look like? This is a partial list of our partner organizations at Affirm. We have more than 24 medical, public health, nursing organizations that have joined us to say, we're gonna come together to create solutions rather than trying to work. We all do our own stuff, but we also need to do it as a consensus, right? So this is part of stakeholders, our organizations. I'll say there's not a lot of health systems on there, which is why I'm glad to be here today. Uh, another part of, consent of stakeholders are the people who are affected. On the left is Lori Punch, a trauma surgeon in St. Louis, who's working with her community to create solutions for St. Louis, which has one of the highest gun mortality rates in the country. In the center, Scott Charles, a community activist from Philadelphia who works with at-risk youth to distribute gun locks and change practices. And on the right, Jim McMillan, who's a journalist uh, in Philly, now in Missouri, and he is a stakeholder too. Media are key stakeholders in this fight. Along the bottom, of course, are CEOs. And as I was having a conversation prepping for this, who's missing? The business community. You know, there was that letter that was published of 142 CEOs calling for changes in gun laws, but they are not stepping up to the plate, despite the fact that this affects every business every day. You think about the amount of money that they spend on active shooter drills, on protection, when you fire a worker, what you have to do if you're worried that someone's gonna come in and shoot up your, uh, your, your workplace. Um, whoops, sorry, I went back instead of forwards. Um, and then this is the other group of stakeholders that has been systematically left out. This is my co-founder of Affirm Research, Chris Barsati, who's sitting over there. He is also an emergency physician. He's a gun owner and a firearm safety instructor for 4-H. He thinks of gun ownership as a heritage, a privilege, and a responsibility. And he and I created Affirm together because we are convinced that the only way forward is to create a path for gun owners to be leaders in this fight. We've got car safety by having Volvo and Subaru compete to see who can have the safer car and which one I'm gonna buy for my kids. And it is only through inclusiveness and honest listening to stakeholder voices, not just kind of lip service about depoliticization, but actually including the people who are affected and at risk that we're going to make progress. So finally taking action in my last uh, two minutes that I'm allotted here. I'm gonna to totally tell you exactly in one slide, no, just kidding. So <laughs> the thing about this, as others have said, right, is that like HIV, like car crashes, like cancer, there is no magic bullet, if you'll excuse the pun, right? What taking action looks like is a variety of things, but it is essential that we do things. So step one is changing the conversations. It's forums like this. It is our This Is Our Lane hashtag that went viral last fall after that amazing ACP paper, right, and inspired many of us to do things like come here. It is taking research and using it to inform practice. This is a picture of the um, violence intervention group based out of St. Louis, out of WashU in St. Louis. We're working with them at a firm to help create evidence as to the efficacy of their programs and to help them better target, if they have limited resources, which kids they should intervene with and how. It's programs like this. This is led by one of my close friends and um, the head of our research council at a firm, Emmy Betts. Um, she lives in Colorado. She's done this work with firearm owners to create a web-based program to guide firearm owners in the moment of a suicidal crisis through what they can do to decrease access to lethal means in a way that is acceptable, usable, and feasible. So this is an example of the type of research to practice, the closing the gap that can create real change. 
And another example is work that I see Renad Vedas here that I'm doing with her and with others across the country to look at the effect of social media on the propagation of violence and on our community's response to it. I see Charlie Brannis too, also part of my group that's working on this. Finally, as many of us have talked about education, this is a picture from a community-wide forum in Chicago that I led um, in October. That's Congressman Bobby Rush. Um, we're also holding events such as Reframe. Um, Dr. Barsati just had an event up in uh, uh, rural Massachusetts on the border of Vermont where he got the National Shooting Sports Foundation, local gun clubs, to come and join in a discussion about how to decrease gun suicide in their community in a way that both created healing but also created um, the potential for change. And so I cannot um, overstate it enough, the importance of education and engagement, of sharing stories in a way that moves us towards action and evidence. So I will close there, I'm right on time amazingly, um, with this which is one of my favorite quotes, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And looking around this room, I am inspired and hopeful because I know that together with all of you here, putting your hearts and minds, your brains, um, and your commitment um, to this issue that we really can solve it. I have more hope than I have in over a decade. It's partly through events like this, it's partly through the larger group that I work with, and I'm just so thankful for all of you being here today and for the opportunity to speak. Happy to talk more later after the break. Thank you.